Good morning and welcome to our Smarties webinar on artificial intelligence in market research. I will share with you today two case studies of uh, what we do at Insights Consulting with artificial intelligence and I will also give a little introduction on the status of artificial intelligence. If you go to a conference nowadays, can be a marketing conference, a business conference, or a research conference, you hear a lot about deep learning, machine learning, pattern recognition, automation, artificial intelligence. All these words are really buzzing today. And you could ask yourself the question, is this the next hype? Let's do a little investigation. There are two characteristics of a hype. The first one is that we are using different words to say the same or the same words to say different things. Is this also happening in this field? Looking at all the words that you saw on uh, the second slide, is this also the case? I think so, because all the words that you saw could be placed under the umbrella term artificial intelligence. So all those different words almost link to the bigger concept of artificial intelligence. They are all a part of what we could call AI. And artificial intelligence is actually the broader concept of machines being able to carry out tasks in a way that we would consider smart. So, where are we today with AI? Well, actually, we could say that there are three types of artificial intelligence. First of all, we have narrow AI. Secondly, we have general AI. And last but not least, we have super AI. Narrow AI means that a machine or a smart system can do one specific task very well. For example, the people at Google, Google DeepMind, who were playing um, a, a little game of Go against a human, the super champion, that's narrow AI. The machine is able to understand Go as a game very, very well. Another example of narrow AI is Amy Ingram. Amy Ingram is a personal assistant developed by X.AI, a startup, and Amy is able to book your meetings. So she will uh, have a dialogue with the people that want to book a meeting with you, she will look into your calendar and she will arrange the meeting. She will even, if needed, uh, order some food or uh, a good coffee uh, for during the meeting. So that's narrow AI. A smart machine helps us and is doing one specific ta task very well for us. And within narrow AI, you see systems that are pure automation, so very rule-based, but you also see systems that are a little bit more advanced and that are self-learning. Amy, for example, is very much rule-based. She knows your preferences, and based on your preferences, she will book the meeting for you. The game of Go by Google's DeepMind department, that's very much self-learning. The system has uh, taught itself how to become, let's say, a world champion in playing Go. So that's narrow AI. Then we have general AI. What is that? Well, it's a machine who can do different tasks very well, and the machine also makes itself smarter. So the machine becomes better at doing all those different tasks over time. Where are we in terms of general AI? Well, I think we only see the first signs of this. Despite what you might read in the news, and especially on the technology websites, 99% of the AI systems today are narrow AI. 
So general AI, we are just seeing the first signs of that. And then the third level is super AI. That's when we reach what they call singularity. That's when machines become smarter than humans. Machines even become smarter than all humans on the planet. You don't need to fear super AI today because scientists predict that it will take us at least two decades before super AI will be there and before the technology uh, will have advanced uh, in that direction. So what you need to remember is that today most of the AI systems, 99% of the AI systems are narrow AI. They are built and trained to do one specific task very, very well. So we investigated the first dimension of what could be a hype the words that we're using, the terminology that we're using. Secondly, a hype is also happening when lots of people are talking about something, but most people actually don't know what they're talking about, and only a handful of people has really experience with the new thing. Is this also happening with artificial intelligence? I think yes, because if you look at the latest GRID study and if you look at what we're doing with artificial intelligence today in market research, there are lots of people talking about it, but only a handful of people is really doing something. And most people read about it in the news but haven't thought very carefully about what it could mean for the market research profession and what it could do to the market research industry. Because if you look at the numbers on this slide, it's only 23% that today already thinks that AI could be a game changer for market research. But if you look at what um, trend watchers, futurists, um, management gurus say about AI, they are all convinced, together with all the scientists who are working on artificial intelligence, that it will be a game changer for every single profession, that it will be a game changer for almost every single industry. But we as researchers seem to think that we are immune to this change. So I think we need to level up our game and we need to start to imagine what artificial intelligence could do for us as researchers. A second thing that we see uh, when we talk about AI to people is that a lot of people have fear for it. And that's normal because if you look at the history of technology, uh, humanity has always had fear for new technologies. We were a little bit afraid of steam engines. We were afraid when electricity was coming around uh, the corner. I think some people in the audience will still remember the days that internet and digital was coming. And it also lots of people um, didn't know what to think about it, didn't know what to do about it, uh, underestimated the power it would have, and some even had fear for it. And that's the same with artificial intelligence. But I think that we don't need to be afraid of it because artificial intelligence can actually be a positive thing for most industries and especially for the market research industry. Because AI can help us to get rid of the monkey jobs, of the repetitive tasks that we still do on a day-to-day -day basis. Artificial intelligence can take away those tasks, can automate them, can do them for us, can do them maybe even better. And artificial intelligence systems can also help us to do things that were just not possible before. Can help us to augment our own human intelligence. So I think we need to embrace artificial intelligence. It can really be a good thing for us.
And if you look at my explanation about the difference between narrow AI on the one hand and general and super AI on the other hand, and that most of it today is still narrow AI, we could say that we don't need to be afraid of the fact that machines will take over our jobs in the next 10 to 20 years. No machines, AI systems, will become our little helpers. They will help us to do things faster, to do things better, to do things that were just not possible before. Meaning that we as humans can focus on empathy, can focus on soft skills, can focus on generating added value by using the skills that we are really good at as humans, using the skills that are unique to humans. So is artificial intelligence a hype? I would say yes it is. Because we use different words to, do, to say the same or we use the same word to say different things. And we should say that artificial intelligence is the broad concept where technological advancement is creating machines that can help us as humans to do things better, faster and different. And secondly, yes, it's a hype because we are talking about it, but we are not taking action. And today, I think the time has come that we should look at artificial intelligence and look at what it could do for our industry, for our business, and especially within market research, a profession where there are still a lot of repetitive tasks and where there's still a lot of room for improvement. We should look into what can AI systems do to make market research better to do things that were just not possible before. It, the time has come to dive into what is it, what can, can it do for us, and to experiment, to build systems, little narrow AI systems that can help us to do different things, to do real life tests with those systems, to learn from what goes well and what goes wrong, and to share our experiences with the rest of the industry. And that's exactly what I want to do with you today. I want to share with you two AI systems that we have built, that we have tested. I will share with you our learnings. And I hope that by doing that, we can make little by little and together as an industry progress. And we can make our industry future-proof and we can make our industry a better one by applying AI systems. So I will share with you two uh, case uh, studies. The first one is um, a study where it's a um, back-end system, a back-end system that is helping our moderators on our research communities, our consumer consulting boards, to manage the health of their community. The second case study will be around activating insights within an organization where we have created a chatbot called Galvin who helps, let's say, the corporate market researcher to bring insights to as many people as possible within the organization. So it's an insight activation chatbot. Why have we chosen those two domains within market research? Well, because we think that those two um, fields or those two uh, kind of systems and platforms are part of the future of market research. We have applied AI to research communities or consumer consulting boards because communities of any form are the future of research or are a big part of the future of research. If you look at market research spent today, 5% of the annual global budget that is spent on market research already goes to community systems. If you look at predictions for the next 10 years, amongst others by Ray Pointer, he says that in 10 years from now, 70% of all market research done will be done on 
community platforms. So communities are definitely the research platforms of the future. That's why we think it, that if we apply AI to uh, a methodology, we should apply it to the methodology that will be most popular in uh, the future. So that's why we have chosen to uh, build a backend system for our moderators to help them manage their community and their the health of their community. Secondly, um, we applied AI to insight activation. Why? Because based on studies that we have done ourselves, but are the also studies done by others, we see that the biggest unmet need today of corporate researchers is not getting in better insights, but it's activating the insights that they already have into the organization in a better way, making more impact with the insights that they already have. So that's why we created an AI agent, a smart chatbot that can help corporate market researchers to activate insights within the organization. I will now share those two case studies uh, with you. I will explain what we have uh, created, and I will also tell you uh, what our learnings and conclusions are. I will introduce um, each of the um, case studies by uh, referring first to a movie uh, each time that probably uh, both of uh, that probably most of you uh, will uh, will know or are familiar with. So let's start with the first uh, case study: proactive community management, a back-end dashboard for community managers to manage the health of their community. And I want to refer here to uh, the movie Minority uh, Report. In the world of uh, Tom Cruise, in Minority uh, Report, murder, future murder can be seen. Future murder can be predicted and is also prevented. If we take this kind of um, vision and we apply it to research communities or consumer consulting boards, we could say that it would be fantastic if we could look into the future, could see which participants will be still good participants in the future. Will they still participate frequently enough? Will it still be the case that what they say is insightful? And that we cannot only predict it, that we cannot only look into the future and see what will happen there, but that also today, we can prevent the future from happening so that we don't have participants that will not participate anymore, so that we don't have participants that will participate but don't say anything insightful or meaningful, so that actually we always have a very healthy, productive and insightful community. So, we have created a system to do that, a backend system, a backend dashboard that can help our community managers and moderators with that. Because the system that we have created uses two months of activity data on one specific community to predict for that specific community what will happen with every single participant in terms of the frequency of participation and the quality of participation, the quality of what they say. So based on what every member has done in the last two months, we predict what every member will do in the next two months. So that means that a community moderator can literally look two months into the future. They can literally see what will happen with every single participant in terms of frequency of participation and quality of participation, in terms of how many times they will react to a certain task or a certain question and how insightful their kind of answer will be. We use 
data that is both quantitative and qualitative for that. We use how have they participated in the last two months? What's their kind of participation pattern? And we also look at what they have said in the last uh, two months. And we look um, at all their kind of verbatims. We apply text analytics uh, to that. And our text analytics system is looking at what's the cognitive effort that they have put in? What's the cognitive effort they needed to give that answer? So we look at their participation patterns, both in terms of frequency and in terms of cognitive effort put in to give an answer. And based on the patterns of the last two months, we predict for every single me member the patterns for the next two months. And based on that, we can score every participant. We can tell for every participant what kind of participant they will be based on quality and quantity of their answers in two months from now. Will they be a community star? So somebody who participates all the time and gives very insightful answers. Or will they be, in two months from now, a high potential? So somebody who is participating from time to time, but when they participate, their answers are really great. Their contributions are fantastic. Or will they be louder on the low end, pacifists or annoyers? And it's especially when we see that we will have a lot of pacifists and a lot of annoyers that we need to take action. That we want to take action today to make sure that the future will not happen. That they will not become the participants that we have predicted for the next two months. So how is our system doing? Well, today we are able to predict with 78% um, of um, accuracy what their quantity of participation will be and for 71% of accuracy what their quality of participation will be. In the world of prediction systems, this is really good. How is the scoring compared to human moderators? Well, a human moderator will, would probably do slightly better if he or she has the time for that. But the thing is, a human moderator will never look at two months of data for every uh, single individual participant to predict what that person will do in the next two months. And they will for sure not do that for 100 or 150 participants. So this system is maybe not as good in predicting the future as a human, but it can do this in no time, almost in real time, for a large scale of participants. So that's the beauty of the system. It's the difference between the system doing it for you at slightly lower accuracy or you not doing it at all as a moderator. So that's really cool. So the moderator really has a view on what will happen with my community in two months from now, with every single participant. And then there is also the prevention capability, of course. The system learns how it can prevent the future from happening. So the system really gives for every single participant, based on the quadrant they are in, a suggestion to the moderator what action they should take. So normally, a community moderator will manage the community as a whole. The system here allows to take a very specific action for a group of participants, given the quadrant they are in. So annoyers get a different kind of prevention approach than pacifists, for example. And the system, based on who those participants are, will give a suggestion what kind of action could be taken for that group of participants. So for some participants, the system will suggest send them a reminder email, send those guys a motivation email, take up the phone and call those five participants or send a text 
message to those 10. So that means that not only the community moderator can become a proactive manager of, of his or her community, they look at what will happen with my community in two months from now, but they also take action today to make sure that it will not happen. They can, for example, have three groups of participants, 10 who they need to call, 20 that they need to send a text message, and five others that need to get a motivational email. So it's saving the moderator time, because the moderator doesn't lose time in the future when the health of the community goes down, no, he or she takes action today to prevent the future from happening. And he or she is using a very personalized approach to be sure that every single participant will get back on the right track. So this backend system, this kind of AI-driven dashboard is really a time saver for community managers and it allows them to keep their community healthy all the time and it allows them to not only have some kind of general kind of engagement approach towards the community but to also have a personalized kind of approach for certain member groups. What have we learned about um, AI while uh, building the system? Well, first of all, that for AI systems, you need a lot of data. So it's really good that in the last 10 years, we have done almost a thousand communities because that means that we have a lot of data about what kind of behavioral patterns are of community participants. And it's all of that data that allows us to see patterns, to teach our AI system what community members do and how they behave. And based on those learnings, our AI system is making predictions for the future. So capture data. That's the first thing you need to do. Because it's only when you have a lot of data that AI systems can learn from that data to make predictions. Secondly, we have also learned quite a couple of things about adoption of these uh, systems by our moderators. We have seen that for the people ha that have um, been part of the creation of this system and that have been part of the tests that we have done with this system, that you need to tell them what the AI system is doing, what the logic is behind what the machine is doing. Because it's when they understand what data the machine uses, what kind of patterns the machine recognizes, and how the machine makes its predictions and its uh, suggestions for a kind of personalized approach for each of the members, it's only then that our moderators will trust the machine. So don't make AI systems black box, make them white box. Machines will only be trusted by humans if people know what the machine is actually doing. And last but not least, we have created here, yes, a AI dashboard for our moderators to look into the future and to manage their community in a proactive way, but based on all those uh, predictions based on all those patterns, we also got uh, some best practices about moderating communities. So next to the dashboard, the system is giving us also all kind of other kind of best practices. For example, we have learned, and that's a funny thing, that uh, if a community uh, moderator talks a lot about him or herself, that that's detrimental for the health of the community. That's one of the kind of more general learnings uh, the AI system has given us next to uh, the prediction dashboard. So that was the first case study. That was a backend system. That was a system that moderators can use to help them to manage their community in a better way, in a more proactive way, and to be more productive. The second system is not in the field of 
insight generation, but in the field of insight activation. And it's not a back-end system, but it's a front-end system. And here I want to introduce this case by uh, referring to the movie Her. In the movie Her, the actor Joachim Phoenix is actually falling in love with his AI personal assistant. By the way, the AI is, uh, system has the voice of Scarlett Johansson. And um, you see in the movie that little by little, he is trusting the system, that little by little, uh, the system uh, becomes part of his day-to-day -day life, and that little by little, he is literally falling in love with her. So, if we take this science fiction movie, if we take this vision, and we try to bring it back to the day-to-day -day job of a corporate market researcher, we uh, try to take it back to the world of bringing insights to as many people as possible within an organization. What are the problems then uh, we need to solve? Well, first of all, there can be a lot of insights within an organization, but probably they are locked up somewhere in a PowerPoint report of 100 slides that sits on a server. So if a marketeer wants to find back that one little insight that he or she could use to make a better decision for the next innovation or the next marketing campaign, it's almost impossible for that person to find it back or it would take a lot of time. Even for the corporate researcher, they then call or mail, it's still a huge effort to go and look in different PowerPoint reports, go through lots and lots of slides to find that one little insight or key fact or key figure that could help that marketing person to take a better decision. So if we could solve that, that would be great. If consumer insights and the right consumer insights would be at the fingertips of a marketing person and a corporate market researcher, that would be fantastic. Secondly, if consumer insights could be used by as many people as possible within an organization, that would increase the return on investment in consumer insights quite drastically. So we want more effectivity by bringing it to more people. We want more efficiency by having literally consumer insights at our fingertips. So how can we use AI for that? Well, we have created an insight activation chat bot. We have created a smart assistant for market researchers and we actually have created a robot colleague, if you want, for every CMI manager in the world. So as a front-end system, we use here chatbots. Chatbots are the new apps, if you want. Um, because apps, you need to open them, you need to fill out, let's say, a form before the app can give you what you need. But you don't need to open an app, you know, you just chat with them in Messenger, WhatsApp, or Skype for Business. And you don't need to fill out a form, no, you literally have a conversation with them. So that's why today um, bots, chatbots, are called the new apps. So we use that as a front-end system. And we made the bot smart by using, again, just like in the previous example, narrow AI, meaning that it's on the one hand rule-based, the system knows if you ask a question what the answer is, and the system is also to a some extent self-learning. It gets smarter if it knows more about you, about your company, and about the type of questions you ask. So what can this uh, smart assistant, this insight activation chatbot do? Well, Galvin, as we call uh, the bot, 
can do three things for you. The first thing uh, he can do is it can impersonate a consumer. For example, if you have a segmentation study, and for each of the segments you have created a persona, Galvin can become that persona. So suppose that you one of your um, segments are uh, young ladies, and you have created a persona called Joanna. Well, Galvin can become Joanna. So you can have a chat conversation with Joanna. Galvin will use all the key facts, figures, and insights that he knows about that particular segment to give answers. So this is a way to meet up with customers, to meet up with an aggregation of all your customers, and to bring personas to life in a slightly different way. The second uh, use case is where Galvin becomes your coach. So Galvin is connected to a database of insights, a database of key facts and key figures. It's still a database that is curated by humans. But Galvin knows how to find things back in a database and give it to you in a smart way by answering your questions or even if it's not clear to him what you need, asking a couple of follow-up questions. But that database is also in the cases where our clients have um, our social network to distribute insights throughout the organization or studio. It's also linked to what other people within the organization are doing with those insights. So in the second use case, Galvin is telling you what other people are doing with certain insights, other people like you. And in the morning, when you first come on WhatsApp or Slack or Skype for Business or Facebook Messenger, Gavin will say, given that other people are using this particular insight, other people like you, probably you also want to know this insight because maybe you also want to apply that insight to your work because a lot of your colleagues that do a similar job are working already with that insight. We envision a future where Galvin can look into your calendar and can tell you, well, based on the meetings that are on your plate today, given the fact that you're, for example, meeting up with the advertising agency about that new campaign for that particular target group, maybe it can be handy to read these three insights because they can serve you during the meeting. The third use case is where Galvin becomes, let's say, your assistant, where you sit into a meeting, you, for example, are deciding together with a design agency on the next pack for your product, and you're doubting between option A and option B. You can then take your phone, start a chat with Galvin, and ask Galvin, Galvin, what do we know about the kind of distinctive assets a packaging for that particular product should have to be successful on shelf, to catch immediately in the store the attention of potential customers. And Galvin will look up what he knows about that and will tell you in just a matter of seconds. You can use that to make the decision and you can continue your meeting. So here, Galvin literally becomes your kind of personal assistant, your kind of insight activation helper. What have we learned? Well, the people that have used the system find adoption really easy because it's like chatting to a person in your messenger system, in the system you already use. So there is a very low barrier to start to use Galvin. Is Galvin perfect? No. Is Galvin super smart? Not yet. But Galvin can do the trick. Galvin can bring a persona to life. Galvin can recommend you what you should read. Galvin can help you during the meeting in a better way than a search engine would do. So people are quite satisfied with Galvin today.
It's helping market research managers to save time. It's bringing insights at their fingertips anywhere, anytime. It's helping so also the um, corporate researcher to save time because they say that 20% of their time goes to answering those type of basic questions that Galvin now answers for them. It makes consumer insights more used and popular within the organization and eventually it makes that consumer insights are used to make decisions so that more decisions are consumer-centric decisions. So what have we learned by building this front-end AI system? Well, first of all, that it's all about relevance. It's not about what can we do for AI systems, it's about what can AI systems do for us. So that means that when we think about AI systems, we need to look at what's the market research process, what's the process of activating an insight within an organization, and how can AI help us to take away repetitive tasks, to do things quicker, to do things different, to do things better. Here, we literally looked at how can insights come to life within an organization? What could be three use cases, in this case, where AI could help us and where a chatbot could help us? So we defined the three cases that I just explained to you based on an investigation looking at human behavior, at the behavior of marketing people, CMI managers, when it comes to activating insights. Secondly, we also learned that next to the fact that the system needs to be smart, the system needs to have also chit-chat capabilities. It's not only that the system needs to follow certain logic, it also needs to be able to behave a little bit as a human to have a certain personality, to be able to ask you how your day went, to be able to um, ask you if he was of help last time that you used him. Why is that important? Well, because of the fact that it feels a little bit more human and that such a chatbot has personality is crucial for adoption. People find it fun and interesting to talk to Galvin. They want to see how he will not only help them, but also how he will react to certain questions to the chit chat. People even ask Galvin, Galvin, can you tell us a joke? And how Galvin knows a couple of jokes are not the best jokes, but it makes that Galvin feels a little bit more like a colleague. Do we pretend that Galvin is as good as a human? No, it's about managing expectations on the one hand, and we don't give Galvin a human face, we give him a robot face. Because for now, that is what those AI systems are. They are pieces of technology that have specific intelligence to do specific things very well. So for now, all those AI systems are little robots, are little smart machines, that are literally our little helpers to do parts of the research process or the insight activation process quicker, better, faster, cheaper. So, we're coming to uh, the end of this, uh, this webinar. What can I say to conclude? Well, first of all, I think the time is now to stop the talking and start the experimentation. We have started first experiments. You have seen two where we build it, created and built a back-end system for our moderators and where we created a front-end system for some of our uh, clients already. A system to help you to generate insights in a different and better way, a system to activate insights in a better and different way but we can think of many more possibilities throughout the research process and the insight activation process where AI systems can help us. We can think about systems where uh, they suggest what type of questions we should ask given the briefing. We can think about uh, bots that can help us to do moderation. We can think about smart systems 
that can do surveying in a different way. There are already many systems that help you with the analysis of quantitative and qualitative data. There are systems that can help you to bring the right insight to the right person at the right moment. And that's the exercise we should do. That's where we should think about what can narrow AI do for us already today. And I would say start building those systems. Start experimenting. Learn and share your learnings so that as an industry we can move forward. Because if you look at what has happened in the last 10 years in the market research industry, in the last 20 years in the market research industry, we have seen online coming, we have seen social technologies coming, we have seen mobile coming. And they all had a huge impact on where we are today in market research, digital, social and mobile. If we look at AI, I think the impact of AI on market research will be bigger than those three waves of change together. It will shake up the market research industry. And when you look at the last 10 years, we have missed a lot of opportunities as, the re as researchers. We have given away a lot of the social media analytics to players outside of the market research industry, to functions outside of market research within companies. The same for the explosion of data and big data analytics. We have given away a lot of that to other players and to other roles and functions within companies. Let's not miss the boat for with AI. Let's jump on that AI train. And yes, some of the experiments will be disappointing. Some of the experiments will fail, but it's about learning, it's about start doing things. So please start experimenting and please allow us as an agency also to experiment together with you. And if we think about the future of our industry, I would also like to encourage you to take the GRID survey. Um, we will share the link with you in the chat. We will also share the link with you um, when we share the presentation with you later today over email. Um, yeah, our industry is one that needs innovation and I think uh, taking a survey like that is also helping us to understand where the future of uh, our industry lies. Uh, so take the survey and start to think about what AI can do for you. Start to think about your first AI experiment. So thank you very much uh, for listening to this uh, Smart Tees webinar. Um, I'm uh, happy to answer some questions right now um, that you uh, post on, uh, on, uh, on the chat. Um, I'm also happy to answer questions over email or on Twitter and LinkedIn uh, later uh, today. And uh, if you enjoyed this uh, Smarties, uh, please take a look at our Smarties website because we have uh, two interesting ones coming up as well. So I open the floor now for, uh, for questions. Um, first uh, question is one uh, from uh, uh, Mark. Um, what are prerequisites to benefit optimally from artificial intelligence? You mentioned having much data, but how structured, tagged should this be? Are there other important prerequisites? Uh, very good question. Uh, so data is important. Um, if you look at the two systems that we have created, the first one is making use of millions of data points, uh, millions of uh, data points of what community members have done in different communities and different communities over the last uh, 10 years. Is all of that data very structured in the beginning? No, it's literally uh, different data sets um, sometimes uh, coded in a different way, um, but our uh, data scientist has done uh, a lot of work of bringing those different data sets uh, together. So if you can make sure that it's 
somewhat structured that's already a good beginning but th those data scientists are, are really very smart in bringing different data sets together and um, and in structuring uh, all of that so capturing data is the first thing uh, to do uh, secondly I think it's about thinking very carefully um, throughout research process and the insight activation process where can AI actually help me? Um, where do I have uh, very repetitive tasks? Uh, where um, do I have a need to be smarter, uh, so to say? Um, so it's mapping out where can AI help me or my colleagues? Where can it be relevant uh, for us? So that's a second exercise. Uh, you should uh, you should do and then uh, the third kind of recommendation I would give is think big but start small um, because it's all about um, using the data and uh, certain pieces of software to uh, create meaning to create uh, value so there is a lot of going back and forward between what data you have, what's technically possible, and where you can create value for the users of those uh, systems. So uh, think big, but start small and do a lot of uh, iterations. So hope that that uh, was an answer to your uh, to your question. Um, we will, in the, the next couple of months, by the way, write a more uh, extensive paper around this uh, topic. So we will keep you posted around that as well. So if there are no uh, further questions here on uh, the chat. Oh, Mark has a follow-up question. Really great. So your first case mentioned uh, suggestions presented to moderation. How strict is the follow-up on these suggestions? Are they feedback in the system? Do you have already results on feedback? Good question. So um, we have uh, built a system and uh, tested it uh, with a couple of our um, moderators um, it are suggestions so that means that this is the system makes suggestions it's still up to the moderator to decide what to do uh, or not so that's a, an important uh, remark uh, to make and yes in the future we will um, include the feedback from our moderators as a variable in uh, in the prediction model um, but for now we haven't done that uh, yet but it's still important to um, to know that the system is not making a decision for the moderator the system is suggestion is making a suggestion to the moderator so if there are no further questions um, I will uh, close off here but uh, feel free to email uh, me tom at insights.eu or to uh, drop me a question um, on LinkedIn or Twitter. So thank you very much. Have a great day and um, we hope to welcome you soon at one of our future events or webinars. Thank you very much.